talk about the lower genital tract, the vulva and the vagina. <laughs> Riveting information on your... <laughs> Out there, so I don't know. <laughs> Especially with some of the pictures that we bring you. Okay. All right. So, um, you kind of know all this. The um, the boundary of the um, the perineum um, extends from the mons pubis down to the um, uh, anus and then out to the labial folds. Um, the drainage, the lymphatic drainage, is actually anterior up into the um, uh, inguinal nodes. All right, so the Bartholin glands, those are a couple of glands down at the inferior um, uh, vaginal opening. Normally, you don't feel them. They're not significant. What they do is they provide lubrication, um, but again, usually you don't even know they're there. Now, sometimes, um, sometimes that the, the duct uh, will become clogged and you will form a cyst. And um, that may be completely asymptomatic uh, until it gets fairly large. Um, you may not need to do any treatment if it's not asymptomatic, it's not worrisome. The only time you want to kind of worry about it is if it's, if it's in a woman that's older than 40. Um, if it is in a woman older than 40, you might want to consider biopsying to make sure there's not a cancerous process going on. <clears throat> now, what can happen with the cyst is it can become inflamed, infected, and turn into an abscess. And that is going to grab somebody's attention. Um, these poor gals, you know, are in a lot of pain. They have difficulty ambulating, obviously sitting. Um, uh, obviously, not. they don't want to have anything to do with intercourse. Um, the, the best thing you can do for this is IND it, okay? You, you're going to get immediate relief just getting all of that pressure out of that area. Um, so you would just, you know, inject, and we'll talk about abscesses in, in dermatology. When you're injecting abscesses um, of the skin to, to anesthetize the area, you want to go real superficial because if you get into that pocket, you know, it's just, it could then find an opening and, and spray on you. Um, <laughs> speaking from experience. Um, so, uh, you'd numb it up, lance it, and drain it. Now, sometimes what they will do, you obviously want to get culture. Um, and once you get a lot of that uh, purulent drainage out, uh, just get a, you'll get a culture swab and send that off. About a third of the time, it can be a sexually trans uh, gonorrhea or chlamydia. Yeah. Um, is there ever an appropriate time that you would treat that with just antibiotics instead of IND? I think if it's real small, okay. and if it is, um, if it's still real hard, mm -hmm. um, indurated, if it's more fluctuant, you know that term where it feels kind of like there's obvious fluid in there. If it's fluctuant, you need to IND it. If it's too early, if it hasn't ripened yet, um, you know, <laughs> I know, that's the term you use. Um, if it hasn't ripened yet, then then swarm sits fast, and the antibiotics to kind of calm the, the inflammation down. And then probably have them check back in maybe a couple of days and uh, if, if it, again, if it's small enough, it may kind of resolve on its own, um, but more than likely it's going to need some, or it may rupture on its own sometimes, too. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, sometimes they will place a catheter in there. Um, it is called a, uh, a word a catheter. Um, and it's an inflatable balloon. They put the one end in there, kind of suture it to the surrounding skin, 
expand that little balloon so it stays in there and that just allows uh, an area of drainage and hopefully will um, epithelia, epithelialize, how do I say that, become epithelial tissue so that there's a natural permanent opening so that it will continue to drain as needed. <clears throat> Another way to um, encourage a more permanent opening there is by marsupialization. Um, and that's where they open it up and they kind of fold over the inner edges of where you cut, suture that open again so you have a chronic um, opening there. You're never going to, any abscess, you're never ever ever going to open them up and suture them back together, ever. Because you're just, you know, encouraging another infection. Okay. So let's talk about some other non-neoplastic uh, skin conditions, more rash type things. Um, we're going to be talking about lichen sclerosis. We also call this lichen sclerosis et atrophicus, um, lichen simplex chronicus, lichen planus, and um, psoriasis in the, in the vaginal area. Again, this is, we're going to be talking a lot more, especially psoriasis and some of these things in greater detail here in a couple of weeks anyway. <clears throat> so lichen sclerosis, this is, we don't really know what causes this. I, I have seen this quite a bit. It's just a chronic inflammatory process. Um, again, we don't really know. We tend to see it, it's kind of bimodal. We tend to see it in, in young children and then again in uh, postmenopausal women. People, they tend to have a lot of itching, intense pruritus. Um, but also some burning sensation. Um, this you need to know they are a person who has this is at increased risk of developing squamous cell carcinoma down the road. So you need to monitor these people. Um, obviously when there's a lot of pruritus there's a lot of scratching going on and that can you know set a person up for secondary infections. So basically what you see, again, we don't really know what, what causes this. We wonder if it could be autoimmune. There is a little genetic tendency, we, we do know that. And we wonder if there could be a hormonal influence, again, because of that bimodal distribution. <clears throat> so this is going to involve the, the perineal area. The vagina is not involved here. <coughs> Um, well, basically what happens is you will, you will get red inflammation, but then that leads to, that chronic inflammation leads to scarring, okay? Sclerosis. Sclerosis is, is scarring. Atrophicus, atrophic means skin um, that is scarred down, but it's very pale, very white, and very thin. Okay, so it tends to look more like cigarette paper, onion skin, okay, like a, an old scar. Early scar is very hard and fibrous, it's sclerosed. Um, an older scar tends to be very atrophic in appearance, okay. And what's kind of unique about lichen sclerosis is that it tends to involve the um, <clears throat> perivaginal area and around the anus as well. So it tends to have this kind of figure eight or hourglass. Okay, you want to remember that. Uh, but what can also happen is when you get scarring of this tissue, um, it can, you know, cause the vaginal opening to, to not be as pliable. Um, the clitoral head can become sclerosed. And so these women are, are you know, it, it it really affects their daily life. Okay, so we saw this. How, how are we going to diagnose this? We're going to diagnose this with a biopsy, um, and preferably a punch biopsy. And again, we're going to talk much more about different types of biopsies. A punch biopsy is you have an instrument just like that called a, a punch, 
Um, and it, the punch is a circular um, instrument, it, anywhere from two millimeters to 10 millimeters in diameter. Um, and it is, it has, um, see how deep that can go? It's, a, it's the same in depth as it is in, in width. Does that make sense? Am I making myself clear? Okay. So what's nice about this type of biopsy is you get through the full, the full thickness of the epidermis and, and dermis typically, especially in the vaginal area, you can easily get through the, the dermis because the dermis is not that thick compared to the dermis, say, on the back. <clears throat> so with this, you just do kind of a circuit after numbing, anesthetizing the area. You, it's a very sharp cookie cutter type instrument. You just kind of um, twist it around and you'll feel when it breaks through and then you get a pair of pickups and, and you cut it below, you know, into the uh, sub-Q fat. And you'll send that off and they'll look at that under the microscope. <clears throat> treatment, um, treatment is kind of challenging. Um, the main thing you want to do with treatment is to stop that inflammation. You know, it's the inflammation that's causing the scarring. Um, so we want to stop the progression of this, of this disease. The main thing we use is a very potent uh, topical steroids. Fulvetasol is one that, that you hear a lot that's in class one. Um, now, people are going to say, oh, you're never supposed to use steroids in the vaginal area or external vaginal area, external genitalia. Um, you got to have it. You know, you have to have something that calms this down. And you're going to use it probably twice a day for a couple of months, probably, just to calm all that inflammation down. And, and as you calm that inflammation down, the patient's symptoms are going to improve. They're going to have a lot less itching and, and discomfort. So that's how you can tell that you're, you're making some progress. Once you get the, the symptoms under control, then you taper down off of that, that chronic use of that class one strong, strong steroid. Um, sometimes you may just use it on the weekends, twice a day on the weekend days, nothing during the week. There are a couple of other um, medications that are steroid free, again we'll talk more about these medications. These are steroid free anti-inflammatory medications, one is called um, Protopic or uh, Tacrolimus uh, is the generic name. And then there's another one called Eladel, which is Pemecrolimus. Um, the, the protopic is indicated, it's a little bit stronger than the Eladel, so I would probably go with that over the Eladel. And it comes in more of an ointment base. Um, again, when you're picking topical medications, you always want to think of how are the, how's it going to be tolerated, okay? Greasy something, an ointment is going in that area is going to be much better tolerated than a gel that has alcohol in it, um, rubbing alcohol. So um, usually I'm going to pick a uh, a greasy ointment base, um, unless if I'll always you know offer whichever. Do you think you prefer a cream base or a greasier ointment? Um, and most of the time they're going to pick a greasy ointment, but if they want the cream, the cream is fine too. <clears throat> okay, questions about LS, lichen sclerosis? Okay. Lichen simplex chronicus, and this can be really anywhere on the body. It's just um, the back of the neck is probably the most common, just a habitual scratching, um, but it can also be in, in the groin area as well, in men and women, but we're talking about women right now. Um, another term that is known as is squamous cell hyperplasia. This is not precancerous, okay? It's just that hyperplasia means it's just thickened, all right? And that thickening comes from chronic rubbing or scratching. Usually very itchy, um, usually in the younger population, premenopausal and found in the hair-bearing areas of the labia majora. So that's kind of what it will look like. You'll see 
thickened skin, increased skin markings. Um, we also call this term lichenification, uh, or something is lichenified. And, and when we get into dermatology, I want you to be learning these terms because when you're out on rotations and out working, you need to kind of learn how to describe rashes. Um, that's important. In fact, um, uh, Professor La Victoire was talking about um, a, a gal she used to work with. She's a pediatrician, and she had one of our students recently, and she was just raving about her, except she couldn't describe describe rashes, so I'm like, okay, super, that's my deal. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to um, <clears throat> concentrate on that. And you know what? I, I think that's a very common thing. Uh, even doctors, there are so many doctors who don't know squat about rashes. They just hate them, and they're like, I don't want to know about rashes, so go to the dermatologist and take care of this. Uh, I, you know, dermatology, I don't think, well, I, think, I know they don't, have a required uh, rotation in medical school and I, from what I understand they have very little lecturing and most of them don't show up for it and so um, <laughs> you guys will probably know a lot more Durham than, than the medical student. Now um, what causes this? We don't really know. Um, it can be a number of things. It can be um, it can be something topically, an irritant, you know, uh, uh, a pad that has um, the fragrance in it. It can be a soap they're using. Um, it could be that uh, this person is an avid exerciser and constantly wears spandex, you know, nothing that breathes. It could be psychosomatic, you know, th there's a lot of that. Um, so there's a number of, of directions that can cause this or things that can cause this. I would say you probably for sure before you assume it's it's in their head you need to make sure that there's not something that you can uh, take away out of her daily routine to, to improve this. So you might consider referring to a dermatologist for what we call patch testing. Patch testing is a way to uh, test for contact allergens, things that are touching a person's skin that's making their skin react. Um, how they do that is we take, they have three panels that have um, at least 36 little squares that are impregnated with various allergens. We take these to their back. Um, we have them come back in uh, two days later. Uh, we remove the patches um, and we look and see if they have any of these little squares that are red and inflamed or blistered or, or whatever. And then we have them come back in two days after that to see if there's any kind of delayed reactions. So, um, how do we treat this? Um, yeah, trying to control that itch. Uh, so, you know, you, I probably would use a topical steroid, again, a high potent topical steroid for a few weeks anyway, and then taper down again. Um, you might try some anti-itch oral medication, antihistamine. Sometimes you even need to think about an antidepressant or anti-anxiety type of medication as well. And I, I feel like this one you could probably try to manage, but um, any of these other conditions you're going to refer. If you're just working in family, primary care, the emergency room, and you see any of this stuff, refer to, I would say, a GYN first. Uh, oftentimes GYNs will refer to a dermatologist's office for to help them with the management of, say, lichen sclerosis, but I think I would go to them first for the biopsy and that sort of thing. Okay, lichen planus is a, another skin condition. This is not, you don't see this very often. It, it's, lichen planus can affect the skin as well as mucous membranes, all right? So the, the groin area as well as the mouth. <clears throat> Again, you tend to get this red inflamed uh, areas of skin thought to be autoimmune, but we're not really sure. 
Um, again, obviously, a lot of itching, ear, burning, irritation, dys, uh, dysuria can affect, you know, burning with urination and obviously pain with intercourse. <clears throat> Again, you're typically going to see this in postmenopausal women. And this can involve the vaginal mucosa. Now, one thing, if you see a rash down in that area, um, what's kind of unique about lichen planus is it tends to have uh, what you call Wickham streaming. And these are a, kind of a white, along the border or within has kind of a, of the redness, you have this white lacy look to it. And that's Wickham striae. And you can kind of appreciate that on the edge of the, um, the vulva there. But you can also see it in the mouth. And that's textbook for Wickham striae in the mouth. Um, so, if you see a rash in the groin and you're kind of suspicious of LP, look in the mouth, okay? Because then you can say, oh, yeah, that's, that's LP, and you might be able to spare her a, a biopsy. <clears throat> or just ask her, do you have rashes anywhere else on your body? They might, she might have LP on the cutaneous skin. Again, lichen planus is a, a very chronic problem and, again, can be difficult to, to treat. Again, your very potent topical steroids, again, for maybe a month or two at a time. Sometimes you need to, if a woman is just really uncomfortable, you may need to settle it down with some oral, oral prednisone, oral corticosteroids. Um, if it's just not responding to that, or you're not getting a prolonged improvement, um, then you may need to consider some other steroid-sparing anti-inflammatory medications. You're going to hear that term a lot. Um, things such as Plaquenil. Um, Otesla, I didn't realize Otesla um, is just not approved, FDA approved, but they're doing some studies. Otesla is actually a, a medication, a newer medication, an oral medication, for psoriasis, um, but they've done a few studies with LP and they're, they're seeing some decent results. So um, that's something, again, you'd have to talk to the, or again, you're going to refer this on to a, a dermatology group, um, but you'd have to talk and say, this is not FDA approved for this condition, but we've seen some improvements, talk to them about the potential side effects, and then if they choose to, to try it, you can do that. Cyclosporin, methotrexate, um, and uh, Celsept is what that mycophenolate mothteal is. Um, all those are steroid sparing anti-inflammatory medications and dermatologists use those medications a lot so that a person doesn't have to be on long, long-term oral prednisone. Okay. Psoriasis. Um, psoriasis typically you think of being on the knees and the elbows maybe the scalp, but it's also a rash that likes the groin area, <clears throat> unfortunately. Um, typically, on cutaneous skin, you have the, the pretty dark red with the silvery white scale, but in mucous membranes or um, body folds that we call inverse psoriasis, you don't get that white silvery scale. It's more of a bright red, well demarcated area. Um, it tends to be more moist. Okay. Itching, obviously. And I, I think too, if sometimes it's hard to tell what these rashes are. And and again. You're going to refer to, to either dermatology or probably preferably uh, GYN so that a biopsy can be obtained and then, then go with the, the treatment. Yeah. If someone has vulvar psoriasis, would it be pretty likely that they have it somewhere else in their body? Or is More it likely, it but it can be just in the groin area. Yeah. Psoriasis is kind of weird like that. Sometimes it's just the nails. 
Sometimes it's just the scalp um, and they don't have it anywhere else. But I would look elsewhere, look at the nails, look at the other skin and see if you don't see signs. Look at the scalp, look and see if you don't see signs of psoriasis. And then you can say, oh, well, that's what it is. Or you can biopsy this, you know, which isn't quite as traumatic as biopsying the, the groin. Um, and then you can treat as such. Okay, biopsy. Again, high potency steroids, short term, um, lowering that after it's controlled to, you know, maybe three times a week treatment or just weekend, or using a steroid free anti inflammatory and use, you kind of go back and forth. You know, it's not going to be cured usually with a three weeks of, of high potency topical steroid. Um, it's going to probably come and go. So you kind of treat for a period of time with your steroid, maintain with either three times a week steroid or the, the steroid-free topical agent for as long as you can. When it starts to flare up, then get back on your, your um, class one high potency steroid. Does that make sense? Phototherapy, I don't know why that's even on there because that's not real. <laughs> You're not going to... Put that in the light booth. <laughs> I wouldn't. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some neoplasms, okay? Extra mammary Paget's disease. This is um, very, very slow growing. Um, so generally it's benign. However, you never ever want to assume that it's just a benign thing. This is some this is a, a rash that has potential to, to grow deeper into the dermis um, and and turn into squamous cell. Um, it's going to look very much like probably psoriasis or eczema down in the area. So whenever you see a rash down there, it needs to be biopsy. You're going to see this more in um, postmenopausal women. And the other thing to know is that 20 to 30 percent of the cases, they will more than likely have a cancer somewhere else, most notably breast cancer or colon cancer. So you have to keep that in mind. If you see this, you have to work these other areas up. And you need to, to continue to monitor these and get, get your routine screening. All right, looking at that, I would say that looks like psoriasis, you know, in that area. So you need to biopsy. I think the other thing to, to remember is if you're trying to avoid a biopsy, although you, you know you really shouldn't, but if the person is just way against biopsy, what you can say to compromise is say, okay, let's treat this as though it's eczema or psoriasis for three weeks. Let's bring you back then. If it's not improved, which this will not improve um, on a topical steroid, then say then we have to biopsy because this could be something more serious. Okay. All right, so treatment um, basically going to cut that area out um, again because we don't want to give it time to turn into a cancer. So why local excision? Uh, the difficult thing is oftentimes people don't go in until this is a pretty good sized area and it's hard to get free margins when you're having to cut out a large area in that area of the body. So recurrence is very, very common. Um, sometimes up to 30 to 60 percent recurrence rate. There are some um, topical medications that I don't really expect you to know. 5-FU and imiquimod, um, we use those medications typically for skin cancers, um, precancers, like widespread precancers. Um, these medications help to, to attract the body's own immune system and gets the immune system to fight off those abnormal cells, okay? So sometimes, again, they may consider that, especially if it's a very large area where surgery just isn't possible. Okay, vulvar intraepithelial neoplasm or VIN. Okay, you know, we have the same thing on the cervix. That's why us gals go through um, pap smears. We're looking for any intraepithelial 
changes, cellular changes, um, well, this can happen on the vulva as well. Um, so this is, is dysplastic abnormal change, cellular changes. This is precancerous. If left there, ignore, it more than likely will turn into cancer. <clears throat> it can range anywhere from very mild changes to just a, a, a carcinoma in situ, which is um, very superficial uh, skin cancer. This can look so many different ways. It can look uh, pigmented, it can look red, it can look white. So anything that looks like it shouldn't be there needs to be biopsied. It can be completely asymptomatic or they can have some itching or, or pain associated. Sometimes these, this VIN will occur in, within the area, it'll kind of occur in um, multiple, uh, multifocal. It will uh, appear in, in various areas. Does that make sense? All right, so here's some pictures. Looking at that, I would say, gosh, that looks like melanoma to me. Um, so there's really no way to tell with the naked eye. You have to buy up to that. All right, so we are seeing more of this, especially in the younger women. Why do you think that might be? HPV. <coughs> hmm? Is it HPV related? HPV, that's exactly right. There's kind of two, two types uh, two categories, I guess you will, you can say. Um, you've got the postmenopausal women that tend not to be associated with HPV, tend to have more maybe lichen sclerosis or some genetic predisposition, and then you've got your younger um, group that tend to have HPV. Smoking is is a risk factor. We don't really know how, um, but we know it is. And um, obviously, if you're uh, immunodeficient, such as HIV, that's a risk factor for that as well. All right. So again, um, the degree of dysplasia kind of um, has to do with the depth of it involves within the epidermis, all right? VIN 1 tends to be very superficial. VIN 2 is a little deeper. VIN 3 is, is um, even deeper than that. The VIN 1, VIN 1 is now kind of thought to represent maybe uh, an inflammatory infectious process so they don't really um, freak out about a mild dysplastic changes but they're going to closely monitor that. If it's moderate to severe VIN 2 or VIN 3 then they're going to assume that this is going to eventually turn into cancer and they're going to treat it. Carcinoma in situ is full thickness of the epidermis. Okay. So invasive disease or cancer is not um, considered until it gets down below the epidermis down into the dermis. All right, so we kind of talked about this. They have the VIN 1, 2, and 3. Um, the usual type, the now, now they have kind of a new category system. Usual type VIN, that's um, VIN 2s and VIN 3s, and these are the, the younger group that tend to have the HPV infection. HPV 16 is the, the most worrisome, so you need to remember that. <clears throat> Again, these tend to be multiple, or younger women with multiple sex partners, history of sexually transmitted infections, and, and smokers. Then you have your differentiated type of VIN, 
which tend to be, this is much less common in the older postmenopausal um, category of women. You don't see the HPV infection there, but this one is more likely to turn into cancer, into squamous cell carcinoma versus the usual type. And then you have an unclassified type of N, which is more like that extra mammary um, Paget's disease. Okay, uh, biopsy, biopsy, biopsy. If there's anything you've gotten out of this lecture, it's biopsy. Um, okay, again, treatment of this, it's not going to be in your family practice office. It's going to be with a, a GYN wide local excision. They may consider laser ablation. Again, may consider these two creams that we talked about that gets the a person's own immune system fighting off those abnormal cells. Smoking cessation. If they are smokers, they got to stop because that we know that's a, a risk factor. And this can reoccur, so we need to follow these patients closely. All right, carcinoma. 90% of vulvar carcinoma is squamous cell. Okay. Most of people who have vulvar carcinoma are older women, postmenopausal, over the age of 70. And again, this category is not usually uh, associated with the oncogenic HPV infection, but rather some kind of chronic inflammatory state. Biopsy, biopsy, biopsy. Um, the, uh, the GYN may do what's called a volcoscopy. Have you heard of a, heard of a colposcopy? <laughs> That's where you look at the cervix. This is the same sort of thing. They spray an acetic acid solution, which kind of highlights um, questionable areas, um, turn it kind of a whitish, they call that, what is that term they use for that? Do a, acetyl white, acetyl white. Um, in those areas, they will biopsy, and they've got a, a magnifying glass so they can look all around there. Okay, so here's your punch biopsy. Again, it gets down. Again, that's not going through the full dermis, um, but with any punch biopsy, even if it's to a two millimeter, you're gonna get through the dermis in the, the groin area. You wouldn't on the back or something like that. Typically speaking, you're gonna probably use at least a three millimeter punch to get enough tissue to send in. Some other pictures. I mean, good God, if you see that, you better be referring that for biopsy. <laughs> okay, obviously, same sort of thing, surgical excision with a pretty good size two centimeter. That's a, that's a lot of extra tissue that you're trying to get a free margin with. Um, they're probably going to recommend a sentinel lymph node biopsy where they inject some dye, see where it drains to the first um, <coughs> lymph node it drains to, and they're going to take that out and look and see if it's spread. Treatment is going to be with the GYN. You can also have uh, carcinoma of the Bartholomew glands, uh, very, very rare. Um, again, painless vulvar mass. So again, if you've got um, a woman over the age of 40 with this uh, Bartholin enlargement, you don't want to assume it's just a cyst, you, you will want to refer on for biopsy. And again, they, these can get pretty large before they become symptomatic. Seven centimeters, I would think that would be symptomatic. Can you imagine you'd be feeling like you were sitting on a boulder? <laughs> okay, so postmenopausal women, there's got a lot of postmenopausal stuff here. Um, it's about 50% uh, is squamous cell carcinoma, about uh, 40% is adenocarcinoma in the Barclay gland. There is a propensity for this to spread to those inguinal nodes. So, um, yeah, don't, don't worry about that. Okay, melanoma. Again, this is pretty rare too. I don't think I've ever seen it. Um, but again, they're going to go more to the OPGYN 
doctors, post postmenopausal. Again, one thing to keep in mind, and this can be melanoma in the in the vaginal area or external genitalia or cutaneous skin, is you've got a beast called a melanotic melanoma that is not that black, ugly, pigmented lesion. It can be more pink or skin colored. So I want you to, to make sure that if, if there's something that's questionable, it doesn't have to be pigmented, get a biopsy. Most common area for vulvar melanoma is as in this picture um, in the region of the labia minora and the, the clitoris. All right, so again, and these pigmented lesions could be melanoma, they could be squamous cell, they could be pageants, they could be VIN. So we just don't know until we get a, a piece of it and look at it under the microscope. With melanoma, um, it's real important to determine the depth of invasion because uh, that is, gives a lot of information for prognosis and staging is the depth of the invasion of melanoma. Okay, so again, you're going to refer for biopsy. Again, the, it says no shave biopsy here. Shave biopsy is just where you use a flat edge razor blade and you kind of um, rock it back and forth and get a, a little scoop. The reason why you don't want to do that is you're not, unless if you really take a, a big chunk, you're not necessarily getting down through the whole dermis and you need to and so a punch or just an excisional biopsy where you're cutting out the whole lesion um, and setting that off to see what it is. Okay, talk a little bit about uh, vaginal stuff. Okay, as in the, the um, cervix and the vulva, you can have vaginal intraepithelial uh, changes with the, the cells. Typically, this is unusual for it to be originating in the vagina. It can happen, but it's usually an extension from, from some, something else, the vulvar or cervical, um, but it can, it can happen. Uh, risk factors, HPV, immunosuppression, and then again, if you've had or have uh, coexisting squamous cell of the vulva, cervix, or anus. Okay. Again, vaginal carcinoma originating in the in the vagina is is very very rare. Thank goodness. Older population, mean age is 64. To me, sounds very young, but <laughs> the older I get. <laughs> okay, HPV infection, smoking. Yeah. That, that's a take home. All right, majority is squamous cell carcinoma. <clears throat> Needed. Okay, pelvic organ prolapse. Okay, this is where you just kind of get a weakening of the, this is a rectocele where the, the posterior vaginal wall is weak and you see the, the rectum protruding out. You know, it's not the, the rectum, the, but the, the skin overlying the rectum. You can have a cystocele, which is where the anterior wall of, of the, the vaginal wall is weak and the bladder collapses in against that. Or you can have uterine collapse, which is apical from the top, and it's just falling down. So, just vaginal relaxation, loss of pelvic floor muscles, things like that. The most common is the cystocele. And it can be, it's the third most common indication for hysterectomy. A lot, this is a very common thing. Um, they estimate that 30 to 65 percent of women presenting just for routine pap smear or whatever have at least a stage two prolapse. So 
it's, it's common. <coughs> what are your risk factors? Vaginal deliveries, especially if you've had multiple vaginal deliveries. Um, obviously the age, obesity. Um, Hispanic and white women tend to be a little bit more prone to this versus black and Asian women. Those are the, the big things, but a few other things such as connective tissue diseases. All right, so they're going to feel and complain about a bulge or a pressure sensation down there. It feels like something's falling out. I feel like I'm sitting on a ball. Um, you'll have urinary symptoms along with this potential uh, incontinence or for sure frequency. You may have, a person may have some back or pelvic pain. All right, so cystocele, when you're first doing your external genitalia exam, on the left is just initially. Oftentimes how you will encourage to see this is to have a woman bear down, Valsalva maneuver, and that will increase that abdominal pressure, and then you'll see that, that bulge come from the anterior or from the posterior. Um, treatment for symptomatic. If they're not symptomatic, then you don't really need to, to do much. Um, there are some things they have Kegel exercises, which to help to um, muscle strengthening exercises. And it, it, this can help. Uh, it certainly can help the progression of, of the process. There are other pessaries or things, instruments that you are placed within the vagina um, that lend support. Sometimes they'll do surgical management to, to tuck all this stuff up. But again, you're, if you're working in primary care or something like that, you're not, refer these on. These are some of the vaginal pessaries. Um, they basically have, I think, two types. They have Support, support pessaries and space filling pessaries. Um, support pessaries kind of rest back behind the posterior, you know, you have your cervix here, kind of rests behind the cervix and then up against the pubic synthesis. So it's just kind of in there and it's just kind of helping to lift that up. And then you have other pessaries that just kind of occupy more space in there to just allow, give some support. All right, and atrophic vaginitis. Uh, this, too, is a very, very common thing. 40% um, of postmenopausal women, but only a fraction of that actually seeks medical attention for it. It can affect the urinary system, too, so it's called urogenital atrophy. <clears throat> so again, atrophic. What do you think when you hear that term? What are you, what are you thinking of what the skin is going to look like down there? Or the mucus? Thin. Thin. Thin, <coughs> pale, um, dry, all of those. Um, what, what drives this is lack of estrogen. Huh? The estrogen um, is what keeps that, that, that tissue down there healthy. All right? When we are brand newborns, we get maternal estrogen, and this is what gets that epithelium rich in glycogen. As we hit puberty and that estrogen level really increases, boy, it, it plumps up and it, you just get lots and lots more um, glycogen. The lactobacilli within that area utilizes that, that glycogen um, and the, the they produce a lactic acid, which helps to keep that pH down, lower pH, more acidic. Um, and that favors or, or provides protection against uh, infections to the vagina as well as the, the urinary system. So we need that, that estrogen. When that's not there, when a person has, is postmenopausal or they've had a, um, at a young age, had a complete hysterectomy and taking the, the ovaries out, um, I don't know, medication that may 
encourage the estrogen depletion. All right, so the lack of lubrication in there, a dryness is going to be your number one um, complaint. Dryness, burning, pain with intercourse, vaginal dryness, itching, pressure, maybe a, a discharge, urinary symptoms. Again, it may hurt to, to urinate, frequency, more infections, things like that. Stress incontinence later down the road. With this, I think you always, especially in a postmenopausal woman, you, you always need to examine the area to see what's going on. Don't just assume if she says, oh, I'm having some itching and dryness down in the area. Don't just assume it's, oh, well, she just doesn't have any estrogen. You know, uh, look in the area because there could be some other things. It could be a contact irritant like we talked about before. Um, it could be a vaginal infection or, you know, something like that, perfumes, powders, soaps, things like that, tight-fitting clothing, or it could be infectious. It could have a yeast infection, bacterial vaginosis, trick. All right, so we talked about all this, um, genital, pale, smooth, shiny, um, lack of, of elasticity, Sometimes you can even get introidal stenosis. Um, the opening of the vagina just becomes very stenotic and um, that, that's hard to have intercourse that way. So it, again, it can affect a person's life. And then urethral changes as well. This urethral caruncle is a, is a, it's a benign, kind of a bright red fleshy growth. Um, on the, the posterior surface of the urethral meatus. You may see those more commonly with atrophic uh, vaginitis. Typically, you're, you can diagnose this just by what you see and what you're hearing the patient complain of. Um, what else is gonna give you information that a, a person is, a woman is lacking estrogen? Uh, obviously, the estrogen level. Um, sometimes you can put a little pH strip within the vaginal area and if it's higher than what it should be, that's a good indicator that, that she's lacking in, in estrogen. Vaginal ultrasound. Again, what happens when we have a lot of estrogen? We get thickening of, of that uterine wall. Um, if that's real thin, um, then again, there's not estrogen that's stimulating that mucosa. Estrogen replacement is the main thing. I'm not, I know probably Dr. Uh, Latassi is going to be talking to you about estrogen replacement and that sort of thing. So I know there's controversy right now. I'm going to let her address that. The main thing, the best thing you can do, though, is estrogen replacement at least short periods of time. You've got two ways to do this is, is oral. Orally, the good thing about oral estrogen replacement is that you also have um, uh, bone loss. It helps to prevent bone loss as well as, what else, I'm trying to pure blank on that. Oh, yeah, your hot flashes, your, um, your hot flashes of, of menopause. And then you have transvaginal delivery where you have estrogen creams or pessaries or this ring that's inserted vaginally that, that uh, just continuously uh, gives off some, some estrogen. The nice thing about this is you tend, because you're applying the estrogen right where it needs to go in that area, you don't have to use as much estrogen. Um, the negative is a, a person may just not like to have to mess with the, the cream or, or whatever. <clears throat> Again, you don't get the benefit that the oral supplementation can, can give via the bone loss and the hot flashes. One good thing about the transvaginal delivery is again you're using a lower amount, so you don't. If a person still has their uterus, again, you uh, have you learned that you can, you can 
if a person has a uterus, you don't want to give just estrogen alone because you're plumping up that uterine thickness, the wall, um, and that encourages development of uterine cancer. So you usually need to give progesterone, to, at least for a period of time, to offset that. The nice thing about the transvaginal delivery of estrogen replacement is that it doesn't encourage that as the oral med treatment does. Just using moisturizers and lubricants can, can be helpful, you know, your KY jelly or, or whatever. Um, one thing I found interesting is you don't want a person, if they cannot take estrogen, and there are some women because of DVTs or they have had uh, breast cancer that was estrogen driven, um, don't let them use over-the-counter products that contain ginseng because that um, has estrogenetic properties. So I, I didn't feel that. <clears throat> and sexual activity. Trying to encourage a postmenopausal woman to continue her sexual activity can actually be helpful, um, can be preventative. So encourage that. Any questions? Put everybody to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm excited about Durham here in a couple of weeks. I know uh, a lot of pictures. Um, there'll, be, there'll probably be a lot of pictures on the exam. Not not this exam necessarily, um, but when we get into Durham, there'll be a number of pictures that you'll need to identify. So no questions as far as this goes? Okay. Thanks, guys.